Please rise for the national anthem. We will now have the invocation, please, by Reverend Robert Hendricks from Concordian Lutheran Church. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather together here this day as we commemorate Veterans Day, and we do so thanking you for all the blessings that you have poured out and bestowed on our country. We thank you that even though nothing is ever perfect anywhere, that you have blessed us with such abundance and given to us freedoms, freedoms that are the envy of so many countries around the world. And thanking you for such wonderful things, we also remember that even though you are the author ultimately of all good things, yet none of these things are free. They come with a cost. The cost of so many who are willing to sacrifice themselves, to give of themselves, so that this country might remain strong and free. Therefore, bless us this day and bless the, this commemoration, and help us all, and help our community and our nation to understand that even as we give thanks for the blessings of yesterday, yet we must also remain vigilant against all of the threats that will come in the future. Bless us, and bless this time together, for this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Reverend.
Ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Mayor P. Kurtz. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? It's always a beautiful day in Independence. Good afternoon to our veterans, to their families, friends, and our guests. Today we are here to honor our service members and to remember the sacrifices they have made and the courage it takes to defend and protect our country. As Harry Truman once said, our debt to the heroic men, valiant women, and the service of our country can never be repaid. They have earned our undying gratitude. America will never forget their sacrifices. I'd like to ask the service members and the veterans who are here today to please stand and be recognized. Please stand. Thank you for answering the call of duty. You have made our armed forces the most respected in the world. Now I'd like to ask the family members of any service member to stand. Family members, please stand. We know that you have lived through difficult times and have often had to carry the heavy burden of family. Congratulations again. Thank you very much for your support. The service members we honor today share several fundamental qualities. They possess courage, pride, determination, selflessness, dedication to duty, and integrity. All the qualities needed to serve a cause greater than oneself. Today we honor those who have served our country, whether in time of war or peace. You've shown by example what it truly means to belong to a land of the free and the home of the brave. You have touched each one of us in very special ways. Please know the gifts you have given us will live on for generations to come. Thank you and God bless. we are honoring all veterans today, but today we are also going to have a special recognition for our World War II veterans. And with that, we're going to do a living history with Kevin Hammontree as General George Patton. May I introduce to you General George Patton. Because of Washington, D.C., the budget had been cut prior to 1938 and 39, military budget. That leads us to the point in question here on December the 7th, 1941. I am sure you know where you were, and at that point, precisely at 0, 700 hours, 
On that Sunday morning, we were attacked by the Empire of Japan. We were caught with our pants down once again. We lost over 3,000 men and women. We lost 188 of our aircraft. And you know the ships that we lost. It was only by the grace of God that our two carriers left Pearl Harbor an hour before the Japanese attacked. At the end of the day, on December the 7th, 1941, we were impotent in the South Pacific. General Eisenhower related to me that on December the 17th, he was called into the War Department to see General George Marshall. Throughout that conversation, Marshall explained to him if something cannot be done with our enemies, the Germans and the Japanese, your children and your grandchildren will be speaking German. The world was exploding. The Japanese were taking one island after another with hardly any resistance. Adolf Hitler had total control of Europe. And the people stood back in Europe and did nothing. Their guns had been removed. The Nazis had taken over the government, industry, the educational system, the churches. All but a few people stood against Adolf Hitler. And those that did, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, were placed in a concentration camp. The world looked very bleak. We had two enemies, the Germans and the Japanese. We did not have the manpower or the finances to take on both with tremendous force at that given time. After weeks of debate, it was decided by the President of the United States and the Joint Chiefs of Staff that we thrust everything upon Germany for three reasons. Number one, the V-1 rocket. We knew that the Germans were far more advanced in rocketry than we were. We knew that the Germans we're dealing with heavy water. We knew that their scientists were trying to bring forth a super bomb that would enable the Nazi party to take over the world. That was the first reason we decided to take on Germany. Their engineering, their scientists were far superior. Number two, the Atlantic Wall. When Rommel was defeated and humiliated on the sands of northern Africa, Adolf Hitler called him back to Berlin. Adolf Hitler placed Rommel in charge of the Atlantic Wall, 3,275 miles, all the way from Spain up to Norway and Sweden. Rommel predicted to Hitler the Allies would never penetrate the Atlantic Wall. And to do so would cost them the war. And the third reason, every day in Europe, people were disappearing. Every day, whole families, Jews, homosexuals, blacks, priests, anybody, that the Nazis felt did not line up to the Aryan race was to be eliminated. We knew that we had to get into Europe as soon as possible. The command to do so, after consulting with Russia and our other allies, 
they decided to place my boss, General Dwight David Eisenhower, as the Allied Supreme Commander of the invasion of Fortress Europe. There was no guarantee that the invasion would be successful. There was no guarantee. And to be pushed back, it would take months, if not a year, to reestablish, redeploy, to try again. On June the 7th, or I'm sorry, June the 6th, 1944, Eisenhower that evening, prior to that, gave the command for Operation Hammerhead, also known as Operation Overlord. 176,275 men were to land on the five beaches of Normandy, 60 miles in distance, precisely at 0, 0630 hours. On that day, the ultimate sacrifice was given by one village or town. Have you heard of Bedford, Virginia? On June the 6th, precisely at 0630 hours, as the men deployed on the beaches of Normandy in the first wave, Bedford, Virginia, lost 19 boys in the first five minutes, were killed. Over the next week, another three were killed. By the end of the Normandy campaign, 22 men from Bedford, Virginia, gave their lives to free Fortress Europe. I have up here memorabilia that was found on one of the bodies on Omaha Beach that lost over 2,000 men. The first book that was given to our soldiers, a prayer book for soldiers and sailors that Eisenhower wanted to present to all our soldiers. The second book, Strength for Service to God and Country, was given to our men. And you know who the Gideons are? A Bible society. The Gideons gave all our soldiers New Testament Bibles to be placed in this brass holder that says...